That's my message for Africa. Keep the lights on while you are eating uh, what you don't yes. understand. Yes. Yeah. 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 When you pick up the book, by the way, there's a chapter I put there for African names of God. And when you get to that chapter, you discover that African traditional religions are all monotheistic. Unkulunkulu, Umbelimangi, Mudimu, Ramaseli, Ngari, Gainyame. Hunk upon all those names. They don't talk of a plural God. When the white man found an African kneeling under a tree in prayer, they said he's worshipping a tree. There's no African religion that teaches Africans to worship their forefathers and their ancestors. Ancestors are a historical connecting cable to the creation that happened before we became. Therefore, I am Joshua the son of Lazarus. Lazarus, who is the son of Marara. Marara, who is the son of Maponga. Maponga, who is the son of Minyuki. Minyuki is the son of Muchena. Muchena, the son of Nduma. Son of Nokwara. Son of Chapinduka. Son of Munemtapa. Son of Tobera. Son of Murenga. From the great kingdoms of Guru Uswa, in Embo, the sons of Nangashe were in Ethiopia now. Who are the sons of Ham in your Bible? The sons of Cush, the sons of Adam, the sons of God. Now, when you understand that our ululation of our African genealogy is not worshipping ancestors, but recognizing those who were here before us, connecting us to the one who made us, before we became. Then you say an African worships ancestors. There's no African religion. There's no African spirituality that teaches you to worship your forefathers. It simply says, call on them. And by the way, there's no African prayer that does not end before you say, please tell the one who created you to deal with this problem. Therefore, it's what we call sacred history interpreted in European construct. When an African calls his forefathers, just like a Jew, says God of Adam, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, God of Abraham, and etc. An African, and by the way, white people don't know the Bible. Because well, they don't have ancestors, they don't have tenants, they don't have God. When they say Jesus of the tribe of Judah, they don't know when they say Jesus is a womb. So we cannot help them. Because even the construct of the text itself challenges their culture, which they don't have. When your brother dies, you need to go and marry the wife. The <laughs> white man does not know how to do that. But in Africa, it's not. When boys are of a certain age, please go and circumcise them. The white man does not know how to do that. The black man knows how to do that. Now, so how can you wait for a white man to tell you what is in the text? When the culture and the religion of the text is not European, eighty percent of the Bible is polygamy. The white man does not know that. It comes down to the monogamous concept on the I N. Then we start cheating, cheating, etc. On the left and create media around that. But let's not waste our time. What we now believe is Christianity in China is European culture. Hey, um, Tanami, me a couple of engines, and I'm a fucking name for them shop. My daughter will not leave this house until she's put on a white dress. Because the mother now thinks that a white wedding is superior to a black wedding or a cultural wedding. These are the realities we need to start talking about as Africans. That are we saying what we've accepted as Christianity is Christianity or is it actually European culture? No, I'm saying. Now, tell you, that 60 to 80 percent of Christian practices is European culture. A man who gives you health, drink, 
the witch. A man who abhors the wife accepts the seat of neck tablet and gives him birth to drink is a doctor. And your government says this is a witchcraft act. It's not witchcraft as a noun. It's witchcraft as a question. Witchcraft are you using? Chapter 19, chapter 18, chapter 20, 21, and 22 of the book of Isaiah mm -hmm. talk about the slavery of the black people being shipped to lands afar, and there are women being stripped and men walking with bare buttocks. It's there. Then you read all of it, including Deuteronomy chapter 20. By the time you are finishing chapter 20, 21 of Isaiah, then there is a good news. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return. They shall come back. I'll take you away to your far land, but I'll bring you back to this land again, etc. There's no other nation that was moved in ships and boats. Where, including the Jews people, Where were they moved from? And from where were they from moved Africa. To? to? Into America. Into the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Into Britain. Mm -hmm. And then the same Bible actually goes on to say, but I'll bring you back to your land. Beautiful prophecies. But because of the Eurocentric Christianity, that does not see a black man in the text. These prophecies are never spoken about. We are told that Jesus is coming again. How can Jesus come back again before repatriation and reparation if these promises will not be fulfilled? Then the Bible is a lie. <laughs> so is, is the gospel according to Maponga touching on those issues? That I think what I've just shared with you right now is chapter chapter three, chapter four. Mm. Yes. Who are the chosen nation? Christianity and Islam by nature, they are bullies of African culture. It is expressed in their intolerance of other people who believe differently from who they are. So here's a simple example. If a Muslim walks into this village, the first object is to build a mosque and make everyone in that village a Muslim. It changes your timetable of waking up, you wake up at five, changes your fashion, how you want, changes the way you bury your loved ones. Now you must have to do everything according to Islamic law. Same thing is true with Christianity. Christianity walks into a space, first thing they want to do, as a Zulu, as a closer, take off your shirt and put on your beautiful beads. Hebrew beads, by the way, which are Jewish. Put on your Hebrew gear, which is traditional, and you walk up to church. Christianity will look at you. Though now there's a bit of tolerance, but the, the first glance is, is unacceptable. Because the God that Christianity has does not have tolerance for culture. Does not. Rather, I would rather take off that thing, I put on your shirt, Put a tie on you, put a jacket, polish some shoes, and now you look nice. Because apparently you must become European first before you can become Christian. In order for God to accept you, He cannot accept you in your authenticity. He, he needs first to take you through the culture of the dominant culture, which is the colonial culture, before you can actually become an acceptable Christian. An intelligent conversation needs to take place where we say, Is everything that we are doing in the Christian church Christian? Or some of the things, norms, rituals that we're performing are actually European culture. But now they've been couched and packaged as Christianity. Where we sing, for example, where we dress, for example, where we eat, for example, where we celebrate our things, our holidays, our festivals, our, our, our what, Passovers and etc. Are these things Easter's? Are these things biblical? Christmas. Yes, I've a lot of feathers with some changes that are cutting Easter trees. issue over the Easter weekend. I mean, it's a simple question. No, I understand. How many days are between Friday and Sunday? If I can ask you. Hmm. How many days? I've had that question from a person I used to stay with in Durban in 1999. Okay. I, I couldn't answer it. But what, what he asked the same thing. don't be religious. No, no, I get, I get that. <laughs> I get it. But I don't understand why people It's almost like when the religion such. walks up to you, when the religion walks up to you, Blinds you. It, must, no, it must numb your brain mm. from common sense. So that a simple question like how many days are between Friday and Sunday, you begin to uh, to want to chew your, your thing. It's like almost all the knowledge you went to school for disappears through the window. But maybe Christianity pushes rush. I mean, sorry, faith more than rationality. So if you accept it by faith, maybe you don't have to reason. But faith, faith is not stupid. Mm. Faith is is is, is knowledge. It, it manifests. Faith. You need to know what you believe in. Okay. You cannot believe in nothing. No. So, and therefore, faith is a servant of knowledge. Okay. The world perishes not for the lack of faith. Mm. The world perishes for lack of knowledge. 
people knowledge is superior to faith. Though churches want to establish people who believe, but the Bible says worship God with understanding. Come now, let us reason together. It doesn't say come, let us have faith together. <laughs> in, in our infancy, we accepted everything. In our old age, we question everything. So here you are as a young man, lots of questions, theological questions, biblical questions, authority of the Bible, writing about the Bible, the collection of the books, the difference between the Bible and the scripture. All these things, miracles that happen. Jesus went a bit further to pray by himself. The disciples were sleeping here. And all of a sudden, there's someone who is telling us, this is what he said. But no one was there. See, this is the, the words of Jesus in red in your Bibles. And then he said, but, but who was there to be recording this prayer? Because the Bible says he was by himself. So we must actually believe that uh, he prayed by himself, but John was inspired to be given what Jesus was praying by himself. That's why the letters are in red. Same with Matthew, same with Luke. And same with John. Also, so you, 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 you collect all these questions. And by the way, I went to a very beautiful school, Andrews University. Sent us professors down to the sort of campus who were thorough. And, and, and I think the preparation was quite fast. Mm -hmm. So we were, not, we were not gagged in terms of thinking. Even some other guys the other day, they were busy laughing about this whole concept of 28 fundamental beliefs. I was in part of the charter committee, the general fundamental of this village, mm -hmm. which formulated the 28 fundamental beliefs. 28 or 27 then? There were 27. Mm -hmm. But I was there. Yes. So it's, it's not like I'm coming around with wet behind my ears trying to take chances. But then you have all these questions that keep on piling up and in class. And for the sake of progress, you are told, don't worry, young man, some of these things, you will find them as you are moving into the journey. Then, of course, there's a beautiful answer because it pushes your attention away from the focus area. You have all these other things to be worrying about, homiletics, hermeneutics, how to preach nicely, how to position, how to write your notes, how to do exegesis, and, I, and all these things. And you get excited in, into, the, into the mechanics of pastoral uh, hom 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 homily. And boom, you graduate and you start working. And then the young people start walking up to you Ask some of them even asking you the very same questions that you must be, that you should be having answers to, which were not answered when you were there. And now in old age, when I begin to ask those questions, people take the same mud and throw it on my face and say, you cannot tell us that after 33 years, you're still asking these questions. <laughs> now it's your turn to be giving us these answers. answers. And I say to them, it's not about finding answers. It's about us engaging meaningfully on a conversation where for the longest of time we've not been prepared or interest in having those conversations, uncomfortable as they are. Sola Scriptura, Sola Scriptura. But you know Sola Scriptura, you're only dealing with 66 books. The Ethiopian Bible is 88. What is Sola books. Scriptura, the Bible, the Bible and the Bible, Bible alone. alone? And the question, which Bible? Here's my motivation for Africa. Africa went to the shop and bought a packet of apples. Half the first one. So the apple was rotten. Throw it away. Worms in the womb. Pick up another one again. Half. Second bite, two worms are still there. Pull, spit on the ground. The intelligent friend standing in the room then looks at this one who has thrown away two apples. He says, hey, don't do that. Switch off the lights. Let's eat the apples. Now, that one is intelligence. Because <laughs> you don't, the, the only problem we have here is the abundance of light. That's what is showing us the worms. So if we can switch off the light, we can eat there apples and you let the worms become part of the protein now how do we as africans think that by switching off the light of knowledge and information continuing continuous eating of this rotten so apple will the worms, make them healthy help mm. so in my own thing guys we may as well just switch on the lights while we're eating when we notice what is rotten I think that's what we don't want. We don't want to switch on the lights. <laughs> but would that be your message? That's my message for Africa. Keep the lights on while you are eating uh, what you don't understand. And knowledge. Knowledge is expensive, yes. But if you think knowledge is expensive, try ignorance. You may find that it is equally more expensive. The African people, the duty is on us. In this age of information, ignorance is a choice. I thank you. Panting at the party! Panting at the party!